Hi, everyone. Welcome to Network Capital. Today, we are here with the co-chairs of the Wharton India Economic Forum, Divya, Rishabh, and uh, Gaurav. Uh, the three of them are students at Wharton who've come together with their classmates to put together a very interesting India-focused summit. Um, when I was in, at Wharton, I also helped out with marketing uh, for the forum, so it's interesting that all of us are coming uh, together to have this conversation. But 2020 is a really exciting year. So much has happened. Uh, the whole business model of conferences, uh, the whole MBA experience, uh, all of it has changed. So we're going to hear from uh, the three co-chairs. I'm going to ask them a bunch of questions about their MBA experience, their backgrounds, of course. But uh, we'll try and um, understand what does an online conference, student-run conference really look like? Why should this exist? What are some things that they don't know? What are the unknown unknowns, et cetera? So without further ado, let's dive in. So welcome Divya, Rishabh, Gaurav. Uh, tell us a bit about yourselves. We would love to know. Let's start with you, Divya. Sure, I can, I can go first. Um, I, well, I came into Wharton uh, after a few years of working in both government and consulting, but um, I started out as an undergraduate from Yale. I uh, majored in biology and also hold a certificate in public health. Um, I then went on to move back to India, work with the government of Delhi in the chief minister's office on making Delhi safer for women. Uh, and the reason to move back was, of course, precipitated by the Nirbhaya incident. Um, so I then worked with the police, with the judiciary, etc., uh, on this objective, and then moved on to working at the Britspan Group, which is a strategy consulting um, group that's focused exclusively on providing services to mission-driven organizations for social impact. Um, you know, worked on their healthcare practice and the government advisory practice, uh, and then uh, applied to Wharton because I actually wanted to start something of myself. Um, and uh, Wharton's been really helpful. I'm on my way to hopefully launching something soon. It's called Pinky Promise, and it's a reproductive healthcare startup for women. So that's a little bit about me at Weave. Uh, my core objective is, in addition to working with Rishab and Gaurav on speakers and structuring the conference, etc., it's also in marketing the conference. Uh, so I've had a lot of interesting things to learn about how to market a conference and kind of um, make it an attractive proposition for people during the uh, pandemic and online virtual times. So happy to share that, of course. Thanks for having awesome. me. Uh, delighted to learn more about the conference and Pinky Promise and uh, all the other experiences that you have. Risha? Yes, firstly, thanks for having us. And a little bit of background about me. So like Gaurav and Divya, I am a second year MBA student at Wharton. I have an undergrad from SRCC in Delhi, BCom Honors, and I'm also a chartered accountant. Before Wharton, I worked in Constant Young for a couple of years. I worked in this mobile gaming startup called GameZop for a while. And then I've also worked in Bharti Airtel, where I joined as a young leader, as they call it, in the leadership development program. Spent a year working in different functions in the company and then moved on to my final role, which was in the central treasury team, where I worked closely with the CFO and the treasurer on different strategic initiatives and also worked on the mobile money uh, called Airtel money, which, uh, which functions in Africa. At least I worked in Africa for that product. At Wharton, I've been working with this fintech startup called Finmark, and it's been a really exciting time. Uh, I'm hoping to move into fintech full time as well. So uh, really excited about that. And again, happy to talk about beef in more detail, but just as a, as a quick overview. I, of course, work with Gaurav and Dave on the speakers. Uh, part of the conference, but also work on ops and finance, which is very interesting because ops in a digital uh, conference are very different from how they would be in a, in a conference. But yes, happy to dive more into any of this and more uh, as we speak further. Thank you, Rishabh. Gaurav? Yeah, um, so thanks a lot again for having us. Uh, so I'm uh, a second year MBA student as well, along with Rishabh and Divya. And uh, before, before Wharton, I was uh, working with uh, Bearing Private Equity Asia. Uh, it's a 20 billion AUM uh, buyout focused shop. So was there for three years, um, looking at control investments in Asia and cross-border deals across financial services uh, and IT sectors primarily. 
Uh, before Bering, I spent a couple of years with Rothschild Investment Banking in Singapore, where I was primarily doing infrastructure M&A uh, for clients in Southeast Asia. And uh, before Rothschild, uh, I did my undergrad from IIT Bombay. I uh, did a major in electrical engineering and minor in computer science. Um, so coming back to Wharton, so Weave was one of the things uh, that I had on my mind when uh, I applied to Wharton as well, something I wrote in my MBA application. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad to be at this point where we are less than two weeks away from the conference. And uh, like when I see at what we have achieved so far in terms of the speaker lineup and the rest of the things, everything coming together, uh, I'm already feeling uh, kind of uh, proud of what the team has achieved so far. But uh, specifically in terms of my responsibility, uh, in addition to working on the speaker segment with uh, Rishabh and Divya, um, I'm also looking at sponsorship this year. And this year has been particularly very different. Uh, it's the 25th anniversary of the conference, so a milestone, and uh, first virtual conference ever. So we are happy to dive down into those topics as well as we go along. But thank you again for having us. One quick point yes, of uh, interesting thing is I just realized that both Gaurav and I have both actually written about WEF in our applications. And interestingly, I had a member of the like the admissions interview ask me about that because I wrote written about it in my uh, essay. So yeah, I don't know if there are any aspiring MBA applicants and stuff, but um, it's very interesting that both of us have actually out of the three mentioned WEF in our uh, applications. Yeah, no, there are th thousands of application applicants on Network Capital. They will actually find this really insightful. So 25th year, uh, first virtual conference, lots going on. The three of you have really eclectic backgrounds. You've done really interesting stuff before. Tell us how did you all become co-chairs? What we're really wanting to understand is that how does uh, what an India Economic Forum organize itself? It's student run entirely. So tell us about the process. Yes, so I can talk about how the team is organized and a little bit about the overall process of selection. So the way it works is that we are a team that spans across both the years of the MBA and also across undergrads that are pen undergrads. And it's an entirely student run conference. So everybody on the team is a student. Currently we are five coaches, three of us, of course, and two other, other coaches, they become a and Anuj become who are specifically working on the startup challenge side of things for, for we. And under us, we've divided ourselves into different teams, ops and finances ones, speakers, uh, which you know is a cross-functional team. And then there's sponsorship, which Gaurav is heading, one that Divya is heading, and of course, startup challenge. Like I said, Devika and Anuja are heading. And under everybody, there's a, there's a whole team of uh, undergrads and first year Wharton MBA students. And in terms of the selection process, the way it works is that the coaches who are uh, going out, the outgoing coaches, they select the incoming coaches for the next year. And the selection process involves filling out a detailed application, much like you would for actually an MBA program, and then going through an interview process with all of them, demonstrating that you have an interest in WEF. Uh, and also demonstrating uh, how you will bring your past experience to actually make week successful. Call of the day, feel free to add uh, if there's anything you want to add to that. Yeah, that, that sums, up, sums it up very nicely. Uh, just one additional point is that while we have uh, tried to organize ourselves into different teams, uh, but we all remain very fluid uh, in the sense of just helping across the function as and when the uh, work is required, for example, uh, as we are getting closer to the conference, marketing is some one of the things that is uh, at the top of our minds. Um, but but throughout the process, it's like one whole team, and the objective of that whole team is to ultimately deliver a very successful conference. Super. Um, how did uh, all of you decide the theme of the conference? And uh, when you applied, I'm sure that you didn't uh, figure out coronavirus was going to strike with full fury. Um, Tell us more about the process of selection of the theme and uh, the various rounds of pivoting that was required to pull this off. I think when we started thinking about our, the theme was the first thing we obviously had to decide on as a group of chairs because 
that would then pave way for the kind of panels we'd have, the kind of people we'd call, etc. And that was when um, coronavirus had just hit us. Uh, w- Wharton had just gone virtual, and the guidelines were not yet set, right? In terms of number one, like how long are we going to be in this state of suspended animation? Um, what's going to happen? from just a programming point of view, but also what's happening to the economy, because what an India Economic Forum doesn't just focus on specific industries, it actually focuses on providing a broad outlook associated with India and bringing in so many leaders and representatives together to weave a a narrative. So I think we realize that we really have to keep it current uh, and we have to keep it focused on um, things that we believe India would have to think about and be very deliberate about as it attempts to overcome the economic, social um, ramifications of a pandemic of this sort. So is it is there, is there going to be a COVID recession in India, for example, is something we talked about. Uh, we talked about how we can um, fortify our manufacturing base, how the government can continue to implement its vision for Um, how it sees economic growth in India happening despite this uh, pandemic situation that's been thrown upon it. And what are our roles as representatives of businesses to kind of um, support that vision or or, uh, be a part of that vision? So I think with all of these thoughts together, we deliberated back and forth and went on for, I think, a few meetings and our meetings lasted for like many hours. We then thought, you know, India, self-reliant, resilient and reignited this would actually be our theme because it accurately portrays, number one, the challenges that India faces right now, but also um, helps us understand the kind of growth trajectory that we need to carve out for ourselves that is um, that helps us reach a path of resurgence um, as opposed to something that, um, unfortunately, you know, for example, as opposed to a negative outcome. So, yeah, and, and Gaurav and Rishabh, feel free to add, but this is, we went through quite a deliberate process. Yeah, I mean, as uh, Rishabh and Gaurav answer, uh, I, I think our listeners would really want to understand the self-reliant aspect of it, because that would be a tricky terrain, right? Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, is, uh, is something that is being spoken about much, but uh, can you really solve for a pandemic being Atmanirbhar or self-reliant? That's an interesting question. It's, it's a question that requires debate. And I think that's the kind of question that uh, we've attempts to explore as well. So tell us more about that aspect of it, uh, Gaurav, uh, Divya, and Rishabh. Yeah, I can take a stab at that and Rishabh and Divya, please add. So um, Utkash, what you said pretty much answers it in the sense we, what in the economic forum is a student-run conference and uh, it's a platform to promote debate on topics that are relevant to India and while we have it as part of our theme um, the idea is that we understand there are two sets of views on it uh, one supporting the self-reliance in Atmanibar Bharat then other uh, being more careful and thinking about what could go wrong down that route um, and precisely that is our objective as as uh, uh, organizers of the conference. And you will see that across our panels and uh, the different speakers and fireside chats that we have, uh, that through questions and uh, audiences Q&A and the moderators could bring up this topic across different sectors and industries to see whether that vision makes sense and what would take for that vision to, 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 for, for the country to see through that vision or what are the pitfalls of going down that route. And because we're like completely apolitical, I think that we have the luxury of calling in people um, who will be able to give us some more guidance um, on what this vision actually means for India, right? So we have Nitin Gadkari, for example, who um, would be speaking about this topic, who has spoken about this previously, but then right now there are a lot more questions that emerge every single day as we look at MSMEs and self-reliance for MSMEs, for example, which are a large driver of employment Um, in India. We also have transportation and infrastructure, which is a huge barometer of our economic development. Uh, Similarly, we have the former finance minister, P. Chidambaram, who will also be speaking at Weave. Um, And we also have heads of um, companies like Facebook, or we have General Atlantic, we have um, 
you know startups represented like misho and and then snapdeal so you have so many different points of view from the ground up all the way to that like you know birds eye view level uh, where where we really actually be able to decompose and break it down does self reliant actually means insular or does it mean um putting us on a sui generis path of development we're not so sure about that we don't we don't know what that means right now so it'll be really interesting for us to understand everyone's points of view yeah 100% um and how about um the speaker selection how, what's the process of figuring out who to invite how to invite what's the hustle involved give us a flavor into the boiler room yeah i mean we spent endless hours also on this uh this planning involved uh so much you know effort on our part which we were really enjoying while we were putting it in so obviously once we finalized our themes we we made a list of different topics that you know each of us were personally interested in and which we felt that were being the hotly debated topics around the country and based on that uh, and based on you know then pulling all of our interests together and seeing which ones all of us as a team feel very passionate about while still ensuring that this stay relevant to the economy and the country we then came up with a list of three panels that we have currently on uh, at the conference so the first panel is tech for bharat which is how to ensure that 1.3 billion indians are enabled through technology and not just people living in say the metros the second is uh, a panel on pharma and that of course you know like you mentioned was one of the uh, covid specific panels we thought was very relevant to have as given all the challenges that covid has thrown and and given the opportunity to move on from this for the world india does play a very important part there being a significant cog in the global supply chain and you felt that a panel, a panel on pharma is going to be extremely relevant so that's how we zeroed down on pharma as a second panel and third panel is uh, how to make india a global sporting powerhouse and the reason for this panel was uh to highlight the importance that sports as a segment of entertainment continues to play a significant part uh in in india from a viewer standpoint but also as a career from a player standpoint and how we can make sure that india one day could potentially reach the levels that uh you know a, a developed country like us is at both in terms of training as well as in terms of actual performance in the various events so this is how we kind of zeroed down on the three panels that we wanted to have and apart from panels we also have a list of really exciting fireside chats and the way we went about planning those fireside chats was to ensure that our audiences can get a 360 view of the economy through different lenses and the way as alluded to this in in her previous answer saying that you know we have mr gadkari mr chidambaram bringing in that political viewpoint you know and and an ex finance minister view, viewpoint for example we have mr amitabh khan from niti aayog bringing in that bringing in that administration viewpoint right we have representation from startups again bringing in a very different viewpoint and we also have uh people like ms nisa godrej uh, ms pal goenka you know who are really very successful businesses that were you know family this or legacy business but they have managed to transform them into modern business and view so all of these together together it brings a very uh, rounded 360 view to the conference no i think we were looking for diversity in all respects um so i think that diversity is something that we and inclusiveness is something that we emphasized on as a prelude panel even in november we actually had uh, ms indira jaising the former um, you know additional solicitor general in fact the first female asg of uh, india we had uh, manisha gerotra from moelis and we had nupur garg who's the founder of win pe which is basically women in pe talk about um, experiences as women in the industry and how to you know climb up the power so we thought that this conference um, even in our speaker selection in our panels etc uh, we wanted to ensure that um, the voice was representative and diverse in every aspect so it took a lot of deliberation um, which which was very enjoyable i think because it really um, brought us to this point where we're very proud of our speakers and our panels 
Um, we also, I think, one thing I want to add, Rishabh, to what he had, what to what Rishabh said is the fact that because it's virtual, we didn't want to just stack it up with panels. It's something that we see a lot of conferences doing. Um, there's just one panel after the other the whole day, and you know people tune in and tune out. We didn't want to do that. Um, we wanted to have fireside chats and panels, of course, because we wanted to be an intimate experience. We wanted people to feel like they're sitting in the front row um, at the St. Regis where we typically hold our event. Um, and they have the opportunity to later on walk up to any of these speakers and talk to them. In fact, we have you know, requested all the speakers to devote uh, some time, especially the panelists, to devote some time to be able to talk to students um, and, and professionals after uh, this experience. So I think people who end up buying tickets and registering um, at Weave, we, we're sending them in, uh, like a Google form to fill out so that we're able to like, figure out who can have these interactions and match them. I've never seen this before. I've, I've seen like tables and those kind of things in other conferences, but I've not seen um, this kind of an opportunity to just spend 20 minutes with the head of Facebook, for example, and you know talk about what happened in the panel. Uh, that's not there in the virtual medium and we've worked really hard to kind of bring that in um, to, to Weave. How are you doing that? Uh, because that is uh, so difficult. And uh, while you answer that, if the three of you can also tell us how your MBA experience has been, um, you know, altered because of this pandemic. A lot of people are curious about what happens to an MBA amidst the pandemic. And I think the three of you are perhaps in different places, coordinating a virtual conference. Um, Talk to us about the messy bits. Talk to us about how your class schedules are, because I would imagine it's not a walk in the park. Sure. Um, I'll quickly answer this whole, like, how are we setting that top aspect? I think that uh, what we've realized is because many of our speakers um, come, through our, come to us through connections at Wharton, our own connections, um, and especially value the fact that it's a student-led conference. Uh, they've been quite open. We've actually just sent them an email asking them, who do you have some time to uh, spend, you know, to interact with students and members who are attending the conference later. And they've all gotten back saying, yeah. So I think the uh, interest seeking aspect was pretty easy. Not, not all of them. In fact, we're working on, you know, communicating with them because this is something we decided to do uh, recently. So the interest seeking part has been pretty simple for us. Uh, very straightforward. I think operationally, Rishabh and his team have worked really hard to uh, ensure that we're able to kind of uh, logistically manage this whole selection process, uh, matching process, uh, getting people to then, um, and getting people as well as the speaker into the same platform in order for them to interact with each other. Um, so it's all been, it's been a lot of um, innovative work in the back end. I think that whatever fintechs organization Rishabh works in, he's going to know a lot of the ops associated with like at least these things. Um, but uh, we're really like committed to bringing this experience because that's, that's I think, what sets us apart. Um, of course, in addition to the caliber of speakers and the questions and the programming that we'd be bringing in. But I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Gaurav and Rishabh talk more about their experience before I chime in. No, that's a good summary, uh, Divya. Just, uh... It's, it's interesting how the technology has evolved so much uh, that uh, even despite a pandemic and us being in different locations, uh, we're still able to coordinate and uh, put together this conference. So uh, it's a testament to the team's resilience as well. And also the strength of the Water India Economic Forum brand that, uh, that despite a virtual conference, we are able to attract speakers of this caliber. Uh, and uh, from an MBA experience perspective, I think it's, it's been a difficult year for, I think, everyone around the world. Uh, it's not just for the MBA students. And uh, the school has done the best they can to um, accommodate and work around the problems that were posed by the pandemic. Uh, so we had like virtual classes and stuff. And uh, we, we worked our way through all of those uh, problems. And uh, uh, we're happy to be here at this point. Yeah, and just to add to that from, from an MBA experience standpoint. So being virtual obviously has its cons, but, but it also has some pros. Uh, the biggest one being, of course, flexibility, both in terms, terms of schedule as well, as well as in terms of location. So, you know, being virtual meant that some of us could do part of the semester 
you know, from India, for example, being close to our families, right? Being virtual also meant that we could take on additional work during the semester because it, we didn't have to walk to campus every day, walk back, you know, and we could just log into classes uh, five minutes after we wake up, for example, and devote extra time to some of the things that we could do, uh, you know, say we, for example, or even professionally, like in semester internships, for example. So I think flexibility is definitely an added advantage of this virtual experience. Uh, and as far as the in-person component of the experience goes, uh, of course, you know, we try to make the best of the year through small group uh, in-person meetups, right? Uh, socially distant, of course. Uh, of co now, we all obviously we missed the larger group events that, that happened, but but you know we tried our best to make it work through the smaller events like i mentioned and hopefully if, if the vaccine is you know uh, somewhat successful towards the end of our uh, term uh, and the last semester maybe we could have some of those slightly larger experiences as well yeah we we, we are dying to get our team together uh yeah. working virtually so we definitely want to have uh, all of us together in one place if possible uh, after the conference obviously and then um, celebrated. I feel like personal time is also something that we've gotten. I think Rishabh really alluded to it, but uh, I personally have benefited so much um, in in a very interesting way from 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 COVID because um, I'm actually in my eighth month of pregnancy and planning weave as well as uh, working on my startup and working on Wharton uh, at the same time. And I don't think that this amount of this would have been possible if it were like. Um, physically requiring me, for example, to be everywhere and go everywhere. So I think from like a gender and personal life standpoint also, there have been some interesting dynamics that um, being a student during this time has revealed. I was actually in a call just uh, two hours ago with a group of mothers at Wharton and we were discussing the same thing. We were like, oh, wow, <laughs> like it's interesting how we've been connected with our peers, um, but we've also had time to kind of be uh, connected with family and have a more wholesome life because we're not necessarily 18, 19, getting into our undergrad at this point of time. We're all in our late 20s. We have career objectives. We have life objectives. We have all of these different milestones that keep conflating with each other. So um, it's interesting, like, you know, COVID definitely thrown us a whammy, but uh, we're all trying to like, you know, make, make hay while the sun shines. You know, what I love about all of your answers is that all of uh, you had great things to say about how you're transforming this adversity into a little bit of a, uh, an advantage for yourself. And I think that's such an in important component of leadership, right? They say that it's very difficult to follow a pessimist. And I can tell that the three of you are definitely um, looking at this slightly challenging or really challenging set of events into what can you do about it? So kudos to that. I know it must not have been easy. Um, but let me push you a little bit on that. First of all, Divya, you are a superwoman. I knew it already, and now I know it even more. But uh, uh, let, me, let me actually talk to you a little bit about or get your mind on the serendipity quotient. So a big component of being at a, a good school or a good conference is the serendipity that it entails, the water cooler conversations, the discussion over a cup of coffee or a beer or what have you. So how are all of you, one, in your MBA um, experience and second, at the VEEF planning stage, uh, trying to optimize for serendipity as well? I fully agree on the uh, productivity and efficiency part of it. So Ted, talk to me about the serendipity quotient. So serendipity and the way that it works has definitely changed big time, right? So, I mean, I would, you know, otherwise bump into somebody in the line at Huntsman Hall on my way to grab a cup of coffee before my economics class that I like really don't want to attend or something like that. And uh, we'd exchange a few words or whatever. And then in the next small group dinner, we might just be in the same dinner and be like, hey, I've met you. Like, how are you? Who are you? And then we became good. We become good friends. So I think that those kind of serendipitous occurrences, you're not going to get them. However, a very different kind of serendipitous like 
uh, networking, so to speak, is something that I've at least experienced. Um, we've had, it's just, you have 800 people approximately um, who are all feeling isolated in a way, who are taking classes together on Zoom, for example, um, who still have to work on a lot of group projects and group activities, um, and also who are a part of so, like extracurricular groups and things like that, right? So what I've seen is, you know, I'm in a class, um, a bunch of us have been paired up, uh, five or six of us from very diverse backgrounds have been paired up to write a paper together or work on a project together because a lot of MBA classes are just based on group casework and group activity. Um, and then, you know, we have like fun Zoom hangout sessions and because it's all Zoom, like, you know, who has a dog, um, you know, who's like traveling that day and driving and like kind of dialing in, you know, all of these interesting things about people that you wouldn't know if you were just meeting them in a classroom. Um, so I think it's, and, and people are genuinely like, I think missing that social connection. So a lot of people are trying really hard to like maintain these Zoom calls and WhatsApp conversations and getting to know each other and stuff. So I feel like I've really actually gotten to know a lot of people that I wouldn't have even maybe cared to get to know if they were a part of my study group or something. Otherwise, uh, I might have stuck to like my homogenous grouping, which I'm not doing in this case. So I think that's one element of serendipity for sure. And the other element, maybe Rishabh can speak to it because we're trying to program serendipity into our uh, conference by enabling networking between people. So Rishabh can maybe speak to that. I, would, I wouldn't steal his thunder, but I'll, I'll, yeah, that's kind of how I've experienced it at least. Yeah, Rishabh, uh, uh, that's awesome, Divya, first of all. And Rishabh, uh, Gaurav, give us a flavor of what would it really feel like to attend the conference? Like I have a very macro sense of what serendipity engineering could look like on uh, Network Capital, for example, we have what you call serendipity Thursdays, where our subscribers in groups of three get matched up randomly. And there's a sort of a prompt and they get to connect beyond work, et cetera. And some really interesting friendships and uh, work opportunities come through it. So we've, we've dabbled a little bit. I've seen some softwares that do that. Uh, there are a whole bunch of SaaS startups that are trying to look at this uh, conference as a service model. But uh, what's Weave's point of view? And talk to us about engineering serendipity in great detail, because I want my uh, listeners to really get a flavor of what this might look like. Yeah, so absolutely. And I think in terms of, serendipity and its intersection with uh, with networking we've alluded to it a little bit before in this conversation but our view at weef on enabling human connections is through a shared activity right so and the shared activity that we've defined for ourselves is getting the opportunity to interact with with people whom you typically wouldn't get a chance to get up close and personal with, right? So for example, as they were mentioned, the head, the head of you know, one of the biggest companies in India, for example, uh, you as an attendee have a chance to actually be on a Zoom call with a person like that in a group of say six to seven people, right? And that means that you can ask whatever questions come to your mind. There are other people there who think similar to the way you think, and so those are additional connections, uh, meaningful connections that you could potentially walk away with after that call and through that conference, right? We'll ensure that you stay connected through the conference with those people. And, you know, we will have a list of the people who attended these different sessions with you. So, you know, if everybody's okay with getting connected, even after the conference, we'll make sure that they are connected after the conference. So our view is that when people do a shared activity together, the bonds that are formed through that activity are much stronger than the bonds that are formed. Uh, say, if you were to randomly meet somebody in like a 500 person setting. And that is what we are striving to enable through Weef. And for that, uh, you know, we are, we, what we do is we'll float out, like we mentioned earlier, an interest form of uh, networking where people can indicate whether they want to network with people and whom they want to network with in terms of the speakers they want to network with. And then we'll make sure that we match those people, of course, given capacity constraints to those speakers. And we put together a group of people that together we feel as a group would be 
uh, would value each other's connections. So that is how we are handling sort of this whole uh, human relationship aspect uh, in the conference. Yes, uh, those are great answers. Uh, not much to add there, but uh, I will offer a different perspective um, of what serendipity could mean here. So if you look from a speaker's side, um, and I'll take an example of technology for Bharat panel. Uh, the way we have composed the panel is we have Sandeep Nayak from General Atlantic, who's an investor, um, Ajit Mohan from Facebook India, who is who brings in a big tech perspective, Amitabh Kant from Niti Aayog, who brings in a government perspective, and then Vidit Atre from Misho, uh, social commerce, who brings in an entrepreneur perspective. So when you put together these great minds um, in a panel setting, through that discussion and hopefully not just them, but also the audiences, uh, which will include budding entrepreneurs, students, professionals, business leaders, they benefit from that con conversation as well. So as a platform, we are enabling that and hopefully these minds coming together on this platform, um, we answer that question on what are the challenges and opportunities that exist for building a technology product for Bharat, which can enable billions of Indians. So just another perspective for that. Yeah, that's 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 so important. So as I was saying, we have uh, Serendipity Thursdays on uh, Network Capital. We have Happy Hours, and uh, the reason why we started doing all of that was that uh, a lot of our subscribers started having a little bit of an um, say Zoom fatigue or Teams fatigue or what have you, where there's just too much of content being uh, available, even if it's high quality. And um, we, we realized that people were missing that quotient. So I, I see that the difference between a powerful learning experience is not the availability of content only, but it's sort of how you complement that with, uh, with other things. So I'm really glad that all of you are so intentional about it. Um, and I hope more people participate and uh, take this forward. Um, just like moving on, um, it's a student-run conference. All of you have to do every aspect of the organization yourself. Now, how does uh, like how does this work at a at a financial level? You know, it, this is a first. So you're organizing this virtual conference. There's of course a whole bunch of time that so many students and other people are putting in. Um, when you look at uh, the whole say funding aspect or ticketing aspect of it, what are some philosophies or guiding points that you kept in mind? Nobody knows the answer because the world is figuring out. So I'm not expecting words of wisdom or definitive answers, but what were your principles? Divya, you want to take a stab at that one? Sure, I can, I can, I can take a stab at it. I think that in terms of our principles, um, we're, I think we're at Water in India Economic Forum because we have a genuine passion for being a part of this organization. No one's going to recruit us or no one's going to give us any forks or anything like that based on us being here or not being here. So it's a purely voluntary um, activity that we've all taken up. So I think that during this time of, um, you know, during this virtual conference time, our objective has really been um, how can we deliver the best programming possible? That's number one. And number two is also like, how do we get people, like the best minds engaged in the best way possible? Um, so I think our, our financial decisions um, have largely been predicated upon these questions. So the first, I think, big financial decision is, should we even, um, because at the end of the day, we're not a for-profit company. We're not a not-for-profit um, all we do is leave a legacy for the next year. Um, I think our co-chairs of the previous year, because of a successful sponsorship and fundraising round, left us enough of a legacy to be able to conduct this uh, conference without any issues at all, uh, financially, um, especially during a time when it's, you know, we're hesitant to ask companies for financing, right? During, especially during that kind of a time when everyone's going through a tough time we've been given enough of a legacy. So I think our objective for financing has literally just been, how do we in our 25th year ensure that the 26th year is as successful as we were poised to be? So things like how much do we price our tickets? Uh, do we even price it at all? Uh, we, went, we went by this like, you know, 
for economics uh, rct study right which is um, mosquito nets for example if they when they were given for free they were used as uh, wedding veils they were used as curtains they were used as fishing nets etc but the minute that somebody had to pay a nominal price for a mosquito net i think it became something that people actually used as a mosquito net um so i think we we went by that principle and we said let's let's not charge people a price that it's prohibitive let's charge students much lower than we would charge professionals because we want to en enable students to be able to be a part of this conference and let's charge a nominal amount such that people realize that there's been a lot of work and value that's gone into this conference um we don't actually make revenue necessarily out of tickets uh, but i think it's it was more of like a policy principle so to speak that enabled us to make this decision um in terms of like all of our other financing decisions like we try to be as frugal as possible in everything that we do because we're a student run organization so obviously we don't pay speakers we don't pay for any perquisites um all we pay for is just the operations of running that of the conference and i think we're seeking to save as much as possible because we don't know how next year is going to be um so that the next set of chairs are as um, enabled as we were in our year you know that's a really comprehensive answer it makes me wonder on two things one is that is free the best business model for something like this or is a low cost rct kind of thing works better the second is that um, you know i don't know if you guys read my harvard business review article on passion economy and how to scale it but what you all are doing at what an india economic forum is exactly how passion economy both hyper scale startups are built and also really a powerful organizations trying to solve difficult needs and i think what an india economic forum is interesting is student run not for profit kind of a conference where you're designing for a certain set of outcomes that you want every participant to have and uh, i think it's it's really interesting i personally subscribe to the point of view in today's world if free is perhaps not the best business model uh, if you're trying to do that many things should be free but certain things it's okay to have a uh, a tiered pricing with flexibility to make it free or low cost for people who can't afford it and charge a reasonable price for to those who can but the jury is still out there let's see <laughs> how many people attend the conference and we'll only know them but i think in design in terms of design principles these are pretty robust thoughts i think a lot of our listeners will resonate with it um let's explore um these uh, outcomes then how would you define success for the what in india economic forum a very obvious metric would be number of participants but not really right like i mean that anybody can optimize for but with all of these things that you're trying to engineer and uh create for the participants how are you defining success or what were the you know uh green room conversations among the three of you or five of you or the broader team in terms of defining metrics of success yeah i can get us started and please feel free to add guys so i think in terms of metrics of success like you clear uh, like you mentioned utkarsh uh, it's not just one number that we are optimizing for uh you know whether it's revenue which anyway we don't you know we're not a profit making uh, entity or just pure attendee numbers i think one of the metrics that we would love to optimize for is engagement right we want whoever as into our conference to be fully engaged right we want them to attend multiple sessions we want them to ask questions during an event right we obviously want to have as many questions as many audience questions answered as physically possible uh, as as however many the time permits so engagement is a very important metric for us and we are trying to figure out different ways on uh, to 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 maximize this engagement right the second metric and i my personal view is that we are already there was to ensure and it's more of a qualitative uh, gauge of success was to ensure a strong speaker lineup right we wanted to make sure that if somebody is actually coming in right paying an amount to come you know, to attend a virtual conference then they should be ensured a really power packed lineup of speakers which i believe that we have now right and secondly we also wanted to make sure that 
it's just, it's more than just the lineup of speakers and content but other opportunities like the networking opportunities we mentioned so those were a couple of gauges of success uh, if i can call them that that we we defined for ourselves but yeah feel free to add guys to that if you feel there's anything else as well yeah one one more point to add there would be just the experiences that both our speakers have and and our attendees have um, and this is more from a both from an operational perspective and intellectual fodder that they got out of the conference uh, because as we said at the start of this podcast that um, the objective is to promote discussions on topics that are relevant for um, india's growth story going forward so we want both the speakers and the participants to have that feeling after they have gone through the conference that this was worth their time and they they learned something out of it and they would want to come back next year uh, which we already see by the way in the speaker side and i'm sure in the audience side as well but but that would be another objective that we would be solving for yeah i just want to add to that really quickly i think that something that we have noticed is that there are all these like repeat panels and panelists right so to the point that panelists are really good friends with each other and they know each other really well and so um we 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 also want at the end of the day to further dialogue uh, so we of course we deliver a lot of um, power pack programming to our attendees uh, but we're also an organization that projects a particular vision for india uh in multiple industries so we also want these extremely influential people to go back uh to their offices saying ji this was really interesting maybe we should do that in our company or you know this has actually uh broadened my perspective of um the way that we should conduct sports as a business or make india a sporting powerhouse so i think that you know these are just examples but we also want to be able to further dialogue in national and international spheres in terms of the issues that we are focusing on so i would say um that is a soft metric it's really difficult to observe uh, we've heard it anecdotally from a lot of our previous speakers and we really hope that we can hear that again this year i love the the, uh, the way the three of you are thinking about measuring the impact i mean some unsolicited uh, a uh, feedback that we get from network capital our community because we run what we call these cohort based fellowships which are a little bit uh, like yours just that they run over a long period of time is that actually number of people attending is perhaps not the best metric so we compared basically the fellowships with uh, with hundreds of people and fellowships were with say fewer number of people but if you measure for number of people you actually sometimes miss the experience and it's hard to figure out what one learned on the other hand if you actually optimize for engagement and really see how's the speaker feeling how's the like what are the people actually learning and taking away in terms of relationships content etc that's perhaps a more accurate uh, kind of a benchmark uh, in this kind of thing and one way also i feel that you could uh, look at the the post conference stuff is you would have amazing content come out of this conference right the way you stitch it all together could be something for you know your future generate future batches and uh, for others to watch and see so that content coming out can you know in time be pursued or watched by other people we see it on network capital that many times when people sort of bookmark their content and save save it on pocket etc and then watch it at their convenience so you could also see uh, stuff like that happening and i think all of you should provide that flexibility to the people that you don't necess- even if you're missing out for whatever reason you can engage and participate in this kind of a way perhaps looking at forming a small sort of a group of attendees uh, there are lots of stuff that you can do but i think you're already way ahead in thinking about these things and uh, i am personally really looking forward to the conference um any concluding thoughts from all of you um and how can please tell us how can our, our uh, folks or people around the world find what mindia economic forum find more about it yeah the easiest way to find us is to go to whatinindia.com that is our website you will find all the details about the conference on the website you will find the link to register as an attendee also on the website so i would say that is the one place they should land to know everything about this year's conference 
Yeah, and the parting thought that I would say is that, you know, of course there is, we understand there's a lot of content out there competing for your limited attention. And we, we respect that. Uh, but what we know is that we have tried to put together an experience which is very different from a YouTube uh, search that you can do and, and you know, uh, watch a video of. Uh, we are enabling an experience that will go much beyond that. And we are also enabling a community of attendees, for example, that you know, we could also look at in future connecting together and, and, and allowing more opportunities for serendipity. So we would, of course, encourage you to check us out on whatnedia.com. And if you feel that there is value for you there, then definitely go on and register uh, for the conference. Yeah, I think for me, in terms of my parting thoughts, it's what I started off with, um, which is that I think that What in India Economic Forum provides room for a lot of aspirations. So the first time I actually went to WEF, I was um, aspiring to apply for my MBA. Um, and I got a promo code and a ticket sent to my organization uh, because one of our partners was a speaker there. So I decided to tag along and I went and I bumped into so many people and I also got a flavor for what what it really stands for and the kind of community that its students are trying to create. I think that that really, really helped me a lot um, in eventually being a part of Wharton um, and in bringing the right tone of voice and things like that to my application, but also in understanding that this is the right place for me to go to uh, from an asp aspirational standpoint. I think that it's also, you know, it also that way I think it helps a lot of uh, professionals. It helps students to network with uh, key industry leaders so that they can get that next big opportunity going forward. Um, and I feel like we have all of those elements intact, even in a virtual setting. And we've worked really hard day in and day out to be able to bring that to people. So I am actually not that concerned about are people going to sign up or not, or whether uh, this is going to be a, uh, it's not going to be a webinar. It's not going to be a unidimensional experience. It's going to be a multidimensional experience. So I'm just really excited for it and very proud of like what all we've done and where we've come up, come up to now. Thank you, Divya. Gaurav, anything else you want to add? No, nothing more to add, actually. Um, but uh, we just just uh, one, one last thought would be that uh, there's a lot of quality content uh, coming up over the four days, 8th, 9th, 15th, and 16th of January. These are the four days uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. IST. Um, so please go to waterindia.com and uh, register yourself. Um, and to see for yourself what what an Indian Economic Forum is all about. Uh, this is the 25th year, so great milestone for us. And hopefully, um, the viewers of this podcast also join us for the conference and have a good experience at the end of it. And I think last Absolutely. year we're really excited to we're excited to partner with Network Capital because we really value communities. Um, and so I think we're we're excited, Utkarsh, that you know you can also kind of come on board as our community partner and. Uh, I'm excited to see what this synergy leads us to, to do and to take forward. Yeah, uh, Divya, as I told you earlier, I'm really looking forward to the conf uh, conference. I'll be sitting with notes, uh, with my notebook on. I love to learn, and this conference does sound like an amazing opportunity. Um, and I believe that the three of you also have a discount code, which uh, people who have watched this far deserve. So do you want to conclude the podcast by telling us how to avail that, and then uh, we'll see you at the conference. Sure. Um, so the discount code, if I'm not mistaken, is N capital at Weef. Um, so we'll we'll be we've publicized that, and I think all the communications and things like that, and it gives you like a flat fifty percent discount um, in order. Oh, so it's N capital Weef. Sorry about that, and it gives you a fifty percent discount on your tickets. Um, at whatever category, be it a student or a professional. And we hope that, um, you know, that incentivizes more people to join because, you know, it, it brings down the bar. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll share the code with our community and I hope lots of people join from Network Capital, from other parts of the world. Uh, and kudos to all of you. I know it must have been so hard to pull this off. Fingers crossed, looking forward to it with uh, excitement and uh, you know, eagerness. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Awesome.